The Grand Canyon is posited by evolutionists to be millions of years old. They say it was slowly carved out by the Colorado River. This would be impossible because, among other reasons, as the river enters the canyon, the walls slowly incline upward. The slow water would have to flow upward. All of this is unnecessary. What evolutionists fail to realize is that the entire canyon could be carved out in anywhere from a few days to just a few minutes. The creationist view here is obviously the most likely. What a vastly different set of views. I just had to investigate. At 277 miles long, sometimes 18 miles wide, and with depths of over a mile, the Grand Canyon is the largest canyon on Earth. Instead of the evolutionist scenario of slow-moving water carving out the canyon, many creationist scientists have proposed that torrents of water from the biblical flood could easily carve out a canyon like this. The problem with this scenario is that on the canyon walls can be seen several layers of different sedimentary materials. According to creationists, these layers would also have to be deposited at the same time as the canyon was being dug. This means this scenario is nigh impossible. Multiple layers of mud remaining upright as an entire canyon is being dug through those layers? Obviously not likely. Throughout the 1980s, many creation scientists developed the dam breach hypothesis to explain the canyon. In this scenario, the supposed geological column was deposited by the biblical flood, solidified, and was later carved out rather quickly by a dam breach. This scenario was fully Fully developed and presented in 1994 by Stephen A. Austin from the Institute for Creation Research in El Cajon, California. This hypothesis theorized the past existence of three large post-flood lakes northeast and southeast of the Kaibab Plateau in the basins of the Colorado Plateau. At some point, the scenario suggests a breach in the Echo Cliffs northeast of the canyon causing a torrent of lake waters to carve out the canyon. Creationist Michael Ords, however, notes that there is no evidence for these lakes. No silt deposits, and no river deltas leading into what would have been lakes. Additionally, a dam breach could not create torrents even approaching the speeds and power necessary to carve through the solid rock in the canyon walls. Finally, even if such a torrent could be the result of a dam breach, it would not make such drastic left, right, and complete U-turns in the process. Instead, Ords proposes a late flood channelized erosion hypothesis. It is essentially a hybrid of both theories. The idea is that the layers were deposited during the flood and, as waters receded, runoff eroded the still pliable rock. As can be seen here, natural flood channels create rounded diagonal walls which look nothing like jagged vertical cliff walls in the Grand Canyon. The problem with all three scenarios is that much of the material in the canyon canyon walls is comprised of material that only forms under dry conditions. For example, the Coconino Sandstone is a layer that can be seen midway up the canyon walls. It is formed from Aeolian sand dune deposits by wind erosion and the entire plate stretches throughout areas of Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Nevada. A flood depositing such a massive amount of dry material in one large chunk just can't be substantiated. Above and below the Coconino Sandstone are also several alternating layers of dry and wet formations, including the Supai group, indicating there were several long periods of accumulated environmental changes responsible for the Grand Canyon. Each one of these environmental changes represents an ecosystem that must have existed for an extended period of time. The final creationist scenario is the volcano argument. It is based on an observed occurrence. In 1980, Mount St. Helens blew its top, carving a canyon through the forest. Part of the rock slide debris displaced the water of Spirit Lake, essentially producing tsunamis at the north shore of the lake. As the water flowed back into the basin, it eroded a canyon. The idea is that this is an analog for the Grand Canyon. Since the Uinkaret volcanic field is at the north face of the canyon, this seems somewhat feasible. The reason this scenario fails, however, is that the canyon at Spirit Lake is carved almost entirely through volcanic ash and loose debris from the eruption. The lake itself is actually several meters higher than it was before the eruption. Additionally, the walls of the canyon are now diagonal, whereas the Grand Canyon is comprised of solid rock with vertical walls. As discussed in great detail in Chapter 16, the deposition of materials in the Grand Canyon and other places in the world are more plausibly and authoritatively explained via natural geological processes over a long period of time, with the Colorado River beginning its erosion of the canyon somewhere around 60 million years ago. But there's still the issue of how could the river have flowed uphill initially. As it turns out, the 
entire area is continuously rising due to subcrustal forces at a rate of about 0.06 millimeters per year. The Kaibab uplift at the canyon's face is also uplifting at various rates. These alternating uplifts have been responsible for course changes in the river several times in geological history. So the answer to this question is that the Colorado River never did flow uphill. The area rose around it. In the end, this creationist argument is pointless. Even if the Grand Canyon were created in minutes, hours, or just a few years, it has nothing to do with the age of the Earth, or even the universe for that matter. It is essentially a red herring argument. Relevance. Just another example of how creationism taught me real science. Learn more about the real science behind other creationist arguments by watching other episodes. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may be the subject of a later video. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.